Good evening. I'm Duncan McRae. I'm an associate uh, professor of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies. Um, but more importantly for now, I'm a faculty affiliate of the Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, and on behalf of the center, I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Zachary Mazur, Meza, sorry, um, multiple possible uh, pronunciations, Meza, um, to uh, Berkeley. <clears throat> like, uh, uh, Zachary is doing a huge tour of the United States, and this is his final date, his final tour. I know that rock bands, uh, when they design their tours, they always pick the final night for the most special uh, location. So I can only assume that he's not the same. Uh, Dr. Mazer is a senior historian at Pauline, um, at the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, and a lecturer in, at the Polish Academy of Sciences. He's an expert on 20th century Polish history. Uh, he received his PhD from Yale in 2018 uh, uh, on the subject of Polish history. He's an expert on fiscal history. He's a tax guy. <laughs> His employer, Pauline, is dedicated to a thousand years of Jewish life in Poland. And this relatively new museum, which I think we'll hear something about, is on the site uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto, where 80 years ago this month, in April 1943, in fact, Erev Tessa, uh, yeah, so almost exactly by the Jewish calendar 80 years ago, um, so, uh, some of those confined to the ghetto uh, launched an armed uprising. This then is the appropriate moment to hear his talk, the 1943 Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Survival and Resistance in the Holocaust. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you for having me. And um, yes, of course, save, save the best for last. <laughs> That is always the case, always the case. All right. Um, so I want to talk to you guys today about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, of course. And, um, and this is a particularly important event uh, in Jewish history, I think more so than, um, than some other acts of resistance during the Second World War, uh, partly because of the, uh, the trope, the anti-Semitic trope, um, that Jews went to the slaughter uh, passively, that they did not resist in any way, shape, or form. And this is just, uh, this is just not true. Of course, there were, there were many ways that, uh, that Jews resisted, not just by, by picking up a weapon, but uh, many acts of resistance uh, that, that involved um, finding food, uh, finding water, and, and fighting for every single day. Uh, that was also an act of resistance, and, and we should uh, honor those people as well. And we're going to talk about uh, some of those other, other acts of resistance. Um, it's also important to, to keep in mind that not everyone who resisted succeeded. Many people resisted but did not survive uh, until the end of the war. And so there are so many stories of survival and resistance that we don't even know about. And we can, only, we can only presume or we can only kind of put these things together from the sources that we have. Um, so, let's get into this. Uh, I want to start by just setting, setting the stage with the ghetto itself. Uh, as many of you know, Warsaw was the site of the largest Jewish population in Europe prior to the Second World War. There were about 350,000 Jews who lived in Warsaw. Uh, once the invasion happened on September 1st, uh, Poland was invaded by Germany on September 17th by the Soviet Union. And at that point, a, uh, a flood of internal refugees started moving around the country, and another 100,000 Jews ended up in Warsaw. So uh, by the beginning of 1940, there were about 450,000 Jews in Warsaw. And uh, they were told to live in the so-called Jewish residential uh, district. And at the beginning of the creation of the ghetto, uh, Jews could move freely in and out of the ghetto because there was no wall yet, there was no restriction, but they had to live within this area. Then in uh, November 1940, the ghetto was closed, and there were two justifications given for the closing of the ghetto. The first one was Polish anti-Semitism. They were supposedly protecting them from, from Polish anti-Semites. The second justification given for the walling of the ghetto uh, was typhus. 
there was an epidemic of typhus, typhus and as the Nazis uh, would say over and over, the Jews carry typhus, so we need to keep them away from the rest of the population to avoid uh, spread of disease. So the wall was put up uh, all around the ghetto. It was four meters tall, so about 13 feet, more or less, right? I don't know how many meters, whatever, who can tell? Um, but, uh, but so it was a very, a very high wall, and, uh, and you could see that in, in certain cases, in certain parts of the city, um, there were these strange situations where like this building was basically split in half by, by the ghetto wall. Um, there was a lot of wrangling over the borders of the ghetto, and this was uh, some, of, some of the things that happened um, in that negotiation. Um, with the occupation of, uh, of the Germans during this period, there was a clear uh, racial uh, division that was set up in terms of many aspects of life, uh, but most importantly in terms of food. So rationing was divided up according to your race. Um, and for Germans, obviously, as you can see, they were given plenty of food. For Poles, uh, essentially starvation rations, and for Jews, uh, total starvation rations. Um, what this meant was that Jews needed to uh, figure out a way to bring in more food into the ghetto, mostly through smuggling. And you can see on the right side here is a, a photograph of a, a Jewish child who is being used to transport food and goods uh, back and forth between, between the ghetto wall. Um, as was the case, many children were involved in this, uh, in this smuggling activity because they could fit through these, these small holes. So there, here are some more uh, images of that. This is taken from a documentary film made by a Canadian filmmaker named Eric Bednarski. He made a, a movie called Warsaw, A City Divided, and this is uh, based uh, in large part on a, a film that actually his grandfather made. His grandfather was a, a Polish uh, gentleman living in Warsaw during the war. He managed to get a permit to drive through the ghetto with his automobile, and he had a film camera, and he drove through the ghetto and, and made this short film uh, of the inside of the ghetto. And so this is one of the few sources that we have of the ghetto that's not taken by the Germans. And I'll return to this theme again about how many of the images that we have of the, of the ghetto, or really of the Holocaust in general, are from the perspective of the Germans, and then how valuable these other perspectives are. Um, so in the, in the image on the, on the right here, we can see a Polish policeman. There were the so-called blue police uh, who were uh, part of, uh, who were working in, in concert with the Germans, and many of the blue police were uh, entrusted with guarding the ghetto wall. Uh, many of them were corrupt. You could pay them a little bit of money and get away with smuggling, but if you didn't have the money or if you didn't want to pay them, uh, they might punish you. And in this case here, a, a Polish policeman is, is punishing a child for smuggling. And, and again, uh, here, another stark image of, of that. Um, as many of you probably know, the Holocaust did not begin in 1939 or in 1940 with the ghetto, but it began in 1941, in, in particularly in June 1941, with the invasion of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Nazi Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union along with its allies, Hungary and Romania. Um, and, uh, and at that point, they also brought along with them the so-called Einsatzgruppe and these special mobile killing units who were behind the, uh, behind the front lines, and they were gathering up Jews near their villages and killing them uh, close to their homes. And I mention this because uh, it is oftentimes forgotten that about half the Jews who died in the Holocaust died in this way and not in, in the ways that we often think about in terms of camps and gas chambers and trains and all that stuff. But this is a, a very kind of personal killing that happened uh, with the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 especially. Um, then throughout 1942, uh, these camps that you're probably much more familiar with were developed, and, and you can see up in the uh, top right there is the location of Warsaw, and, uh, and right near Warsaw is Treblinka. Treblinka is very important because Treblinka is the place where most of Warsaw's Jews were killed. And you can see why, because the, the location. Uh, it was very close by to Warsaw, just a short train ride away. So in the summer of 1942, um, it was decided that 
that most of, uh, of Warsaw's Jews would be cleared out. Um, and during this period, Jews were brought to the so-called Umschlagplatz, the transfer station uh, where, where Jews would be gathered and then put on trains and sent to, to Treblinka. And I want to talk about the mechanics of how this actually worked. So uh, here is an organizational chart. At the top, we have Heinrich Himmler. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this Nazi asshole. And then uh, below him, uh, he was in control of the Gestapo and the, the, uh, the SS, which was a paramilitary group within the Nazi party. And the Gestapo and the SS uh, were giving orders to the Jewish council. The Jewish council was a group of Jewish elites, mostly elderly men, uh, who were working uh, along with the Germans. And they were given orders to deliver a certain number of Jews to the Umschlagplatz to be killed. Um, but it wasn't the, the Jewish council or the Gestapo or, or the SS who actually carried this out. They weren't the ones who were actually gathering the Jews physically and bringing them to Umschlagplatz. That was done mostly by the Jewish police, which was a group of about 2,500 people. Um, and uh, they managed to, to gather up 350,000 uh, Jews and, and kill them uh, by sending them off to, to Treblinka. Uh, you may ask yourself why the Jewish council and why the Jewish police would do this. They did it because they thought that they could save themselves, uh, which did not work. And you may ask yourself also, why am I even mentioning this? Um, it's because in 1942, when organized resistance started to come together, when it started to, to formulate, the first targets of the resistors were not the Germans. It was not the SS. They were attacking these people. They were attacking the so-called collaborators, the Jewish police. Uh, and here we have a photograph of the Jewish police and, and its uh, commander, Lakin, this uh, small person here, um, and, uh, and a, an armband from the, from the Jewish police. So in the summer of 1942, in the midst of this great deportation action, uh, a group of political parties, and especially the youth wing of these political parties, came together and decided that they needed to take action against uh, this, this uh, deportation. Uh, and as I mentioned, their first targets were, uh, were the Jewish police. They also attempted to assassinate the head of the Jewish council. Uh, they did shoot him, but they didn't manage to kill him, as it turns out. Um, and uh, on the left side is Mordechai Anjelevich. He was the head of the Jewish Combat Organization. And the Jewish Combat Organization uh, was a union of various political parties. So it brought together Bundists, leftist Zionists, uh, centrists, um, Agudat Yisrael, and all kinds of other groups. Uh, there was a, another political group that refused to join them, and that would be the Revisionist Zionists. The Revisionist Zionists made their own combat organization, the Jewish Military Union. Um, and the inheritors of the revisionist Zionists are the, the right wing in Israel today, uh, Bibi Netanyahu and his, and his ilk, right? Um, so they, they also had their, their own group. Um, so uh, the, the Jewish combat organization at this point, their role was really to spread the word about uh, other forms of resistance and, uh, and try to try to change people's minds, try to, to spur them into action. But they were mostly unsuccessful. And you can understand why. Because during this period, during the Great Deportation Action, and especially afterwards, the people who were left in the ghetto were left feeling completely despondent. All of their friends and all of their relatives had been killed. Everyone that they knew in their lives was gone. And all of a sudden, they were left alone. And they stopped thinking about the future. They stopped thinking even about survival. So you can understand uh, their, their position during, during this period. So what changed? What changed? In January of 1943, so now this is a few months after the Great Deportation Action, uh, Heinrich Himmler came personally to the ghetto on January 9th. And he said, it's, it's done. Let's get rid of the rest of the ghetto. At this point, there were between 30 to 50,000 Jews left in the ghetto. 
Uh, and a few days later, German police and German soldiers came into the ghetto and attempted to clear the rest of the ghetto. And what they were met with, surprisingly, to their end, was resistance from the Jewish combat organization and from the Jewish military union. Uh, and the resistance was so fierce that the Germans retreated. And at this point in January 1943, when the Germans were, were shown uh, that the Jews could resist, the Jews also learned that they could resist, and this really changed a lot of minds, changed a lot of hearts, and people started to think about the future. So what did they do? They started to build bunkers. They started to build bunkers and shelters all over the ghetto, and the thought was that they could survive the next few months, maybe a year, and then the war would end and they would be free. Uh, and this is a map from our temporary exhibition uh, from the museum. Uh, I apologize for the type. There is English below the, the white lettering. I didn't make this map, uh, so don't blame me. But um, it shows a, a large number of bunkers and a number of characters who we're gonna, we're gonna meet in a, in a few moments. And, uh, and importantly, you can see how people were moving uh, between and among these, these different bunkers. Um, and we have a few plans of these bunkers as well in our, in our collection. You can see here uh, some of the complex plans. This is a, an entrance up at the top, a tunnel that people could come down, and then this is a movable brick wall um, on rails. Uh, so a, a very heavy wall, but that, that could be moved on, on rails. Um, this is another, another plan from a diary uh, showing a, a similar kind of outlay uh, with various um, uh, comforts that you, could, that you could find inside of these, and, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So I have a, a long quote. I apologize for the long quote, but it's, it's very important, and you'll see why. This is a quote from... Um, from Baruch Goldman, who was an architect. He was in the ghetto, and, uh, and he managed to, to survive under a false identity uh, until the end of the war, after the uprising. But he writes, Towards the end of January, Engineer G approached me to supervise the construction of a shelter for 25 to 30 people who could spend up to six months there. The shelter was built under a courtyard with the entrance from one of the basements. The interior was divided into a bedroom, storeroom, kitchen, and common room. Water was to be supplied from two water mains, electricity from two different transformers. In addition to electric heaters, the kitchen was to be equipped with a coal stove with a flue led underground through a separate vent. Moreover, there was a backup water supply pumped from a well and a backup electric light in the form of a hand-powered six-volt dynamo. Ventilation was supplied by electric fans and a special system of ducts. The entrance from the basement was camouflaged by a movable wall weighing two tons, while the entire dividing wall from the side of the basement was covered with a three-meter-wide chamber completely filled up with sand. The storeroom, apart from food such as biscuits, potatoes, vegetables, and fat, was to hold a stock of candles, kerosene, fuel, soap, and medicines. All of the outdoor and much of the inside work was completed by the end of February 1943, at which point the collection of food began. And it's truly amazing. I, I need to emphasize again the timing here. So he says, at the end of January, someone approached him to help build a bunker. By the end of February, February is a short month, at the end of February, they're already done building all of this. They've, they've managed to do all of this work while starving and not attract attention to themselves because they're, uh, you know, they're under the control of the German occupiers, of course. Uh, it's really, really amazing what they managed to do in such a short period of time. Uh, and with, of course, little resources. The, you can imagine they, they were going around the, the empty ghetto and gathering what supplies they could. Many people had already been killed, so the, the ghetto was essentially empty. They could take what they wanted, but not all this stuff could be had within the ghetto. I'm sure some of it was bought on the black market. Uh, and just amazing, amazing work that they were able to do in such a short period of time. So. They've got their bunkers, they're, they're hiding out, they're preparing for, for the future. And then on April 19th, uh, the day had come. The day had come when the Germans finally decided to clear out the rest of the ghetto. And at dawn on the 19th, uh, 16 Waffen SS officers and 850 soldiers, including uh, police and others, um, they were armed with machine guns, flamethrowers, small cannons, armored cars, and tanks. And they were met with groups of young 
Jewish boys and girls uh, armed with just pistols, homemade grenades, and Molotov cocktails. At this point, uh, the Jewish Combat Organization had about 500 members. The, uh, the revisionist Zionists had uh, close to 300 members. And they held off the Germans for, for several days. The Jewish military union happened to uh, find or, or, or purchase or steal a heavy machine gun, a heavy German machine gun. And they held off the Germans for, for three days before uh, they escaped through the sewers. None of them survived. Um, till the end of the war, so we know very little actually about that group. Meanwhile, inside the bunkers was, uh, was a slightly different world. Um, so the 19th of April was the day before the first day of Passover in 1943. And Paula Rothschild writes, we were busy with the preparations for the Seder. All of a sudden, someone knocked on the door and informed us in a muffled voice, there was going to be a pogrom in the ghetto. And Leon Nyberg writes, we must now hide in these shelters, tombs, until the end of the war. Stella Fiddleside was writing at the time, in the first days of combat, we were completely cut off from the other houses, and we didn't know there was fighting in the ghetto. So they had done such a good job of isolating themselves inside these bunkers, they didn't even know what was happening on the outside. And Wazaj Menes writes, there were about 30 people in this sweat box instead of the planned 12, and more people kept arriving from the burning shelters. So you can see that it was getting crowded in those shelters. Why? Partly because, as he mentions, there were other shelters that were burning. Why were the other shelters burning? They were burning because the Germans decided at some point they could not fight the Jewish uh, uh, soldiers one-on-one. -on -one. They could not go through some kind of guerrilla warfare through the ghetto, and they decided to change tactics. And after a few days, they just started burning every single building down. Block by block, they were burning the entire ghetto down. Tsevek Okonovsky recalls, who would have thought that the German bandits were to set the entire ghetto on fire along with the people in it? And here we have an image of, of one of those, uh, those old buildings that was set on fire. Um, Wazash Menes writes, the Germans set fire to one house after another, one plot after another. And an anonymous author writes, the clothes the people are wearing are on fire. People scream in pain and wail. Houses and bunkers are on fire. Everything is aflame. Now the Germans being practical people that they are, they decided to call in the fire department. They called in the Polish firefighters into the ghetto to make sure that the fire did not spread to the rest of the city. And uh, because of this fact, we, uh, we have some, some really uh, amazing images that were taken by a Polish firefighter. Um, and this particular firefighter, Zbigniew Grzywaczewski, you can see his name down there, if you don't believe me that I just said an actual name. Um, his, yeah, that's how you spell it. Uh, he, he was quite sympathetic to the Jewish cause, um, he was hiding Jews himself at his own home. And when he was called to the ghetto to uh, fight fires within the ghetto, he decided to take along his camera. And for years, we knew about eight of these photographs. And I mentioned before how rare it was that we would have images taken by somebody from the outside, not having the German perspective alone on the ghetto. So these eight images that we knew about were some of the, the very few that we could talk about uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising uh, that were not taken by the Germans, of course. Um, and in the course of preparing for our temporary exhibition at the museum, our curator, uh, Schnepfkoach, Zuzana uh, Schnepfkoach, she, she was in touch with Grzywaczewski's son, and she kept on bothering him and saying, are you sure that's all? Are you sure there are only these eight photographs? And he said, I think so, that's probably all, maybe. But he hadn't looked through all of his father's stuff. And as it turned out, there was one box that he hadn't looked in since his father had passed. And he looked in there and he found negatives. And as it turned out, there were 33 more photographs that he had taken from inside the ghetto that no one had ever seen before because they were undeveloped and had just been sitting in a box somewhere 
in Poland. Um, and we just literally found out about this several months ago. So this is, this is brand new information. So I'm going to be able to, to share a, a couple of these images with you. The full set will only be available uh, at the temporary exhibition. So if you want to see the whole thing, you have to come to Poland and, and see the exhibition, which will be open uh, in a few weeks and will be open until January of next year. So these are a couple of these, uh, these photographs from, from that period. Um, the one on the left obviously shows uh, Polish firefighters. You can see the firefighters and their fire truck uh, and, and the, the buildings in the background that have been destroyed. And on the right side, we have uh, a bunch of Singer sewing machines. Why would this picture be, be stark to someone at that time? Um, the Singer sewing machines and, and all these machines just kind of piled up there would have been a surprise to someone in this context because having access to a sewing machine for someone in the ghetto would be the, the difference between life and death. You're sitting in the wrong place. You've got you to gotta be over there. You can't, you can't see anything from over there. Um, so having, having access to a sewing machine could be the difference between life and death in the ghetto. So seeing all of these sewing machines just piled up like this and discarded would be quite surprising to someone, which is probably the reason why he took this picture in the first place. Um, and you can see some, some firefighters there in the background. And I want to contrast these pictures with a couple of photographs from the Strope Report. The Strope Report was the report that was put together by the German, the SS officer who was in charge of this operation within the ghetto. Uh, and he had, had his uh, staff take a lot of photographs during the ghetto uprising, and then he published a report on this. And, uh, and these photographs have been used over and over and over, uh, and I'm sure some of them will look familiar to you. So here are a couple of photographs from the, from the Strope Report that, uh, that reminded me of the, the photographs that I just showed you from the Grzywaczewski collection. And you can see on the, on the left side, uh, these are Nazi soldiers who are just observing the buildings burn and enjoying themselves. And on the right side, a conference of SS officers uh, in a similar courtyard, uh, just like in the, the, last, the last photograph. And we'll return to this, this theme uh, a little bit later. But meanwhile, during the uprising, there were uh, there were everyday, everyday struggles. So as Adolf Polishuk writes, under the cover of night, we would go down into the abandoned shelters, those that have already been discovered, to search for food. On the way, we would meet many people looking for their relatives, for shelter or for food. Strange faces looking deranged, dirty, clad in rags, physically and mentally exhausted. And despite all of this, this hardship, they continued to fight on in their own way, not with weapons, but to continue to fight uh, for survival in this situation. On the outside of the ghetto, there were a number of Jews who were living under false identities. And uh, it's interesting to look at their recollections of this period of time, uh, especially because their emotions about it are, you know, obviously quite difficult to deal with. Uh, you, can, you can only imagine what they were feeling, um, and so we can, we can take a look at some of their words. Shimon Glicksmann writes, the stench of burning is spreading across the adjacent quarters of the city. After a few weeks, the whole of Warsaw is saturated with dust and soot. At night, the burning ghetto, akin to a huge bloodshot eye, gazes towards the city and awaits rescue in vain. And this photograph on the right side is uh, another one that was not taken by, by the Germans, but was taken by a, um, a man who owned a photography studio, Zbigniew Borowczyk. Um, he got up on the roof of his building and, and took this photograph. And it reminded me, really, of this image that, uh, that Glicksmann writes about, this, the huge bloodshot eye uh, in the center of Warsaw, awaiting rescue in, in vain, as it were. Another uh, Jew who was hiding on the, on the other side of the wall wrote, I went out to the city center to look at the burning ghetto. The first thing that caught my attention were the merry-go-rounds, jammed with people, crowds bubbling with excitement and curiosity, rushed from all corners of the city to watch the burning district. Many recollections from this time period of, uh, of Poles and of Jews who were in hiding at the time, they talk about this particular image, this image of 
people uh, gathering towards the wall and, and looking at it. And obviously, there were, there were a variety of reactions. Right? There are some, some people who remember this and talk about uh, Poles who were celebrating the fact that the Jews were burning. And of course, there were others who were responding by saying, this is a horrible thing that is happening. How can we have let this happen? Um, one of those people who, who was uh, quite angry about this, this fact was the uh, Nobel laureate and poet Czesław Miłosz, who penned a poem at the time called Campo di Fiori, uh, precisely about this fact that, um, that it, it was too late at this point, right? It was too late to do anything to save the people who were inside the ghetto, um, and, and they had uh, been derelict um, in this situation, had not done their duty to help their fellow men. Um, it's also quite interesting that uh, a lot of people remember specifically this carousel or merry-go-round, and this is a photograph of that, that carousel. Uh, some people have claimed that the, the Germans actually put the merry-go-round at the edge of the wall precisely so they could create this contrast. You could have children enjoying themselves on the carousel uh, while the ghetto burns. And you can understand this, this frustration uh, from, from the Jewish side, of course. And so Marilka uh, is one of the, the authors um, about whom we know very little, but we have her, her diary. Her diary was found, actually, at Majdanek. It was not found in Warsaw, but it is a, a diary uh, in large part of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And she is one of these people who I can say was a resistor, but did not manage to survive. And she wrote, during the uprising, she writes, Behind the red wall, there is yet another wall, a thick wall of indifference, a lack of consideration that Poles have built around themselves. If the attitude of Poles towards us, oppressed and persecuted to death, had been different, a significant percentage of us would have survived. Um, meanwhile, there were, of course, uh, underground organizations, underground Polish organizations that um, were sympathetic to the uprising, but in many cases they had done too little too late. And the Polish, arm, Pol Polish Home Army um, uh, main publication, the Information Bulletin, um, they wrote uh, during the uprising, they say, the hitherto passive death of the Jewish masses did not create new values. It was useless. Death in battle can bring new values to the life of the Jewish people, giving the ordeal of the Jews in Poland the radiance of a valiant struggle for the right to live. This is how the Warsaw public understood the defense of the ghetto, listening with appreciation to the crackling of the defenders' salvos and anxiously following the lunges and fumes of the ever-widening fires. The fighting citizens of the Polish state from behind the ghetto wall became closer, more comprehensible to the society of the capital. So on the one hand, this is a, a sympathetic statement saying, of course, that the, the Polish home army, that the Polish underground supports those people fighting in the ghetto. On the other hand, it is a judgment, right? It's saying that until they took up arms, they were not understandable. They were not a, 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 a group that was worthy of sympathy to the Polish people. Meanwhile, from London, General Władysław Sikorski uh, gave an address on the BBC that he was intending to be heard in Poland. I am asking you to give them any help you can, and at the same time for you to end this terrible atrocity. Um, as it turns out, the Polish Home Army gave very little support to uh, the Polish fight or to the, the uh, Jewish combat organization and other uh, Jewish fighters within the ghetto um, prior to the uprising. Um, this action that I mentioned in January 1943, when uh, Jewish fighters managed to, to fight off the Germans the first time, um, it did change the attitude slightly, and they did give them some weapons, but not nearly enough. Uh, that Well, not nearly as many as they, as they could have. As it turns out, the Polish Home Army had many, many uh, guns and, and rifles and all kinds of um, explosives in its possession. Um, but the decision was made to not share those things, uh, mostly because they felt that it was going to be a, um, a futile endeavor, that the Jews would die anyway. Um, meanwhile, there were a number of Jews who were found in hiding. Um, and those who were captured 
were brought mostly to Majdanek or were shot on site. And this is another photograph from the Grzebatevsky collection, and I want to uh, return to this. But first, uh, let's just hear from, from one of these witnesses, from Marian Barland, who, who says, long columns of Jews are passing at short intervals, hundreds of victims from the burnt down houses, half deranged folk, burnt hair, clothes and tatters, wounded and beaten up. They are floating towards their final resting place. And I think in many ways, that description from Berland lines up with the photographs that we have from Grzebaczewski. These are more of these photographs from Grzebaczewski where he's up in some building here observing the Jews being gathered up uh, and led away. And these two are blurry. Perhaps he was, he was rushed in his, uh, in his photographing. Uh, and this photograph, uh, now blown up, um, is a lot clearer. Perhaps he had, he had more time to take this picture. But again, I, I feel like this photograph conveys the, the, um, the suffering and, and the position of these Jews just as Berlan described them. And we can see some of these stark faces here, the woman looking back and the child up there looking back on the right. Um, here a man is carrying a woman in the center. And I want to compare this now with the Strope Report. So this is a famous picture from the Strope Report. It may look familiar to you. But do these people look like they've been burnt and starving and injured? No, they don't. The child there has a matching outfit. These people look well put together, well fed. And this is all serving a propaganda purpose, which is to say that the Jews are supported by the wealthy elites of the world. They are being given something. Um, I, ironically, the, the Strope Report talks over and over about the fact that the Jews aren't fighting. It's actually Polish fighters who are in the ghetto, because it would be so unbelievable that Jews would be fighting for these Germans, right? So they talk over and over about the, the idea that those are actually uh, Polish fighters who are inside the ghetto. But in actual fact, of course, there were no Polish fighters inside the ghetto. This is another image of, uh, from the Strope Report, uh, another famous image um, of these people uh, found inside the bunkers. And you can see some, some corpses even in the background. Um, and this is another image. Another propaganda image, uh, this one colorized after the fact, of course. And it shows uh, the hero of the report, Jurgen Strope. He's the man right there um, in, his, in his SS uniform. Uh, thankfully, Strope was uh, arrested and tried. He was on trial in Poland, actually, uh, in 1951. And he was sentenced to death in 1952. But before then, when he was in charge of the operation inside the ghetto. Um, in mid-May, on May 16th, when he had decided that, uh, that the number of captured and killed had uh, gone down enough, he, he called an end to the, the uprising uh, and an end to his operation. And in order to celebrate this, this moment, he strapped a bunch of explosives to this wonderful building and turned it into this. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the ghetto looked similarly. Here we have an image from, uh, from British intelligence, actually, from 1943. You can see how, <clears throat> how the entire neighborhood was reduced to rubble. Here, an image from the ground. Um, that church uh, still stands today. It was, uh, it was inside the ghetto, but it was not, it was not destroyed. Um, and uh, it was a place where actually uh, Jewish converts to Christianity would, would attend mass. And here, another image of the ruined ghetto. Um, and in the background, you can see that, that building, that long building, um, it's actually just a facade. This is not a building that was still standing. It was a facade. And it's an important building because it was, the, it was a, uh, the main prison inside the ghetto, and it was also the home of the Jewish council. So this was sort of like the center of, of life in the, uh, in the ghetto. And we'll return to that, uh, that place in a moment. Um, but 
despite the fact that the, the area had been reduced to rubble, uh, people continued to live and struggle in, inside the ghetto. And Leon Nyberg writes at this point, I have been accepted to a combat unit called the Rubblers. The group is made up of uh, 25 young Jewish boys. The arms at our disposal are four FBV pistols, one Colt, three FN pistols, two cylinder guns, and eight grenades. Our task is to defend unarmed Jews who are still in the rubble, self-defense, and finally, to fight the informants. It's interesting that he mentions informants there, since apparently there were still issues with, uh, with Jews who were giving up the location of these, of these bunkers. Uh, Leon Nyberg was a truly amazing uh, person. He was 17 years old at the time the up uprising began. And, um, and he had lost most of his family at this point. Um, his father died in 41. Um, his mother and sister were deported to Treblinka in August 1942. And his brothers all, all died either in partisan combat or uh, had been arrested by the Germans. And um, while he was uh, taking part in the Warsaw Ghetto, up, uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he, he then managed to, to move uh, to the so-called Aryan side, to the other side of the city, um, as of September 1943. And when he, when he did that, he started to write down um, his, uh, his recollections of his experience during the war. Um, he then fought in the Warsaw Uprising in 44. Um, and after, after the war was over in 1949, he decided to emigrate to Israel, uh, where he uh, lived with his wife, and he lived long enough to, to meet 11 of his great-grandchildren. Um, Hena Kucher, who then uh, has gone under the name Kristina Budnitska, is another amazing, amazing person. She wrote in, in September of 1943, we spent two days sitting on planks in the sewers. It turned out that our manhole was soldered shut. We had to go to another manhole. My parents didn't have the energy to do it. They stopped walking. My 23-year-old sister stopped too, not willing to leave our parents alone. They stayed in the sewers forever. And Hena Kutcher's story is one where we can see um, how so much resistance, how years and years of resistance was not always successful. So she uh, was part of a family, a large family. She was uh, the youngest of six. And all of her siblings and her parents had managed to survive together up to 1943. So much advers adversity up to 1943. But they all managed to survive together uh, until the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, some of her brothers were then killed uh, during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. and. Uh, and afterwards, they were escaping through the sewers. And while they were hiding out in the sewers, one of her brothers uh, drank some of the sewer water, and he died of an infection. Uh, meanwhile, her, her parents and sister, as you can see, they also died, essentially, of exhaustion and starvation. And uh, Hena Kucha was the only one to survive. And she was only 11 years old. And at that point, she ended up in an orphanage outside of Warsaw, a Catholic orphanage. Uh, she changed her name or went by the name Krystyna Budnicka. She spent the rest of her life in Poland. Uh, she was a school teacher, and she's still with us, which is why there isn't a, a death date there. Um, and she will be joining us at the commemoration of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in, uh, in just, uh, what is it, 15 days. So very soon. Um, at the end here, I just want to talk about commemoration of the, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So this is a, a, a photograph from 1946. And you can see on the left side is, again, this building that I mentioned before, the, the building that was a prison and, and also the home of the Jewish Council. Um, and you can see all the rubble around. The city was completely destroyed, uh, not just because of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but also the Warsaw Uprising in 44. The entire city was destroyed, but what are people using their energy and resources for? They're using it to build this monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And here you can see uh, what it looks like today. It is meant to look like uh, manholes. Um, and we have this uh, commemoration uh, in text at the top. Uh, then this monument was put up in 1948. 
uh, probably looks familiar to many of you, a much more famous monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This is the a monument that's called Monument to the Heroes of the Ghetto. Um, and uh, you can see these, these glorious figures there in the, in the center. And it is a, a site of commemoration uh, for at least two anniversaries throughout the year on January 27th, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and then on uh, the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, and it is the place where the uprising fighters, um, the remaining ones, would come and lay flowers, uh, as you can see, um, all these flowers here. And it is also an important uh, symbolic location because it faces the Pauline Museum. So as you can probably figure out by now, the Pauline Museum is uh, essentially at the same site where this prison was, where the, where the Judenrat was, the, the Jewish council, um, and it is facing the, the monument to the heroes of the ghetto. So we have now a place to commemorate death and to commemorate the Holocaust, uh, and we also have the museum, which is a place to, to talk about the history of, of Polish Jews uh, in, all of its, uh, in all of its glory. Um, for, for many, many years. Not just to talk about death, but to talk about life and the accomplishments uh, of the Jews. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Zachary. So we have quite a bit of time for, yeah. uh, for some Q&A, um, which I'll just- Very uh, open to I'll, anybody's I'll questions. Yeah. But yeah, but please um, ask any questions that you have. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, I'm curious about today's polls, how they view the Warsaw Ghetto. I, when I was there in 2006, there, you know, there was some heated conversations about contested memories and mm -hmm. who suffered more. And I'm just curious how they see the Warsaw Ghetto today. The ghetto uprising? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the whole history, yeah. The whole history, okay. Uh, that's a longer conversation, which I had yesterday in San Francisco. <laughs> Um, but the, the contested memory is, is very complicated. It's still ongoing. Um, and uh, suffice it to say that, that Poles definitely view themselves as victims. Uh, and there is some competition for, for victimhood. And, uh, and to some degree, emphasizing Jewish suffering uh, is viewed as, as taking away the victimhood of the Poles. Right? And it is also the reason why, if you bring up instances of, uh, of Polish uh, collaboration or accommodation of the Holocaust, then uh, Poles get very offended about that because they view themselves as victims and full stop, right? Nothing else. Um, and so, yeah, but obviously we can, you know, hopefully we can get out of this kind of nationalist thinking and, and understand that, that humans make uh, different choices and, uh, and all that stuff is, is very complicated. Um, as far as the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and how Poles think about it, uh, this is also a complicated question, but um, I can say that the museum has changed people's thinking a lot on this, uh, in part because of a, a campaign that we've run since 2013, where uh, on the anniversary of the uprising, uh, this started just in Warsaw, but now it's, it's throughout the country, uh, volunteers are handing out small paper daffodils, these yellow daffodils, and, um, and on it just says Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, April 19th, 1943. And the idea is to get uh, Poles to be aware of this event, first of all, first and foremost, and second of all, to have them start to think about it as part of their own history. So to integrate Jewish history into the history of this country, rather than having it be two separate tracks, right? And, uh, and we did surveys in 2013 and in 2018. In 2013, only 30 percent of people had even heard of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. That number went up to 80 percent in 2018. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that with us um, and for the work. Did you see anything? I did. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I suppose, as a historian, I'm kind of like a, I'm just fascinated by this finding of the the 33 new photographs mm -hmm. and. Like it made me think about how much else there might be in these kind of places, and obviously all historians grapple with that. But I just wonder, has a museum ever done like a call out or like an outreach thing to try and find, you know, to try and find more of these sort of? So we haven't done, as far as I know, I might be wrong, but I don't think we've ever done an official call to everyone, yeah. give us your stuff. But because we've existed now for ten years. Yeah. 
people keep on giving us stuff. Oh, amazing. So uh, we have more objects than, than we know about. There is a project underway now to start to catalog this stuff, but it's a huge, huge project. Um, and there's, as far as I know, I think it's like 26,000 objects or something like that in our collection. Um, and we really don't even know what it is because people just keep on giving us stuff. And that's ranging from, you know, Judaica that was found or um, the other day we got a, got a message that somebody uh, in a basement in, in a house in Warsaw, they found a door that they said was from a concentration camp. I don't know where these things come from or like why they're around or whatever. But uh, in any case, you know, th these are the kinds of, uh, kinds of things that just show up all over the place. But then obviously it, it takes a lot of work to, to also authenticate things, right? So we, we had a discussion, an internal discussion uh, about how to, I, 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 you know, figure out if this is worthwhile or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah. Can I ask a really quick yeah. follow-up? So is the museum funded? Does the museum get a lot of state funding? And like okay, very, very important question and, and good thing to clarify. Thank you for asking that. Uh, the museum is a public-private partnership. So there are three founding organizations of the museum. One of them is a, is a private NGO, uh, the Association for a Jewish Historical Institute. One of them is the city of Warsaw, which is not controlled by the ruling party, peace, mm. uh, and the Ministry of Culture, which is controlled by, by peace. But what this means is that the museum, because it has uh, those three founding organizations that all have to give the same amount of money every year, um, and the museum can raise its own money, that the museum has maintained its independence mm -hmm. and continues to be, to be independent. Do you have a question? I, I think I'm, oh, there was a question here and then Jennifer. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah, um, how has ideology shaped the memory of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, especially within the Jewish community? I'm thinking in particular of kind of Mark Edelman and his treatment by Israeli society. Um, I actually don't know uh, about the treatment of Marek Edelman in, in Israeli society. So maybe you can tell me. Um, that, that's something that, that I'm not aware of. I know that in, in Polish society, he's held up as a hero. I, I don't know it super well, but um, especially after his decision to remain in Poland and yeah. because of his anti-Zionist views, yes. um, he had a pretty frosty reception among kind of Israeli society and including historians for a while mm -hmm. um, and has been broadly, his role kind of got de-emphasized for a very long time. Interesting, All right, interesting. So I want to go back to this uh, slide of these three men. Okay, so the person on the left, Anya Levich, he was the leader of the combat organization. Uh, he did not survive the uprising. Yitzhak Zuckerman did survive and he was a Zionist, so he went to Israel, as you, as you mentioned, and then Edelman was a Bundist. So he believed that the place for the Jews was not in Israel, but in Poland. And so he remained in Poland. He was a, a gynecologist. He lived in Łódź and spent his entire life in, in Poland. Um, so yeah, so different, different life paths. Um, but each of them uh, was a symbol of the, of the uprising in their own way, right? Very interesting. Uh, From the Zoom yeah, go ahead. audience, uh, a couple of questions. <clears throat> How successful were the bunkers and how long did they protect people? That's one question. I mean, the second one, and this will be the last one from the Zoom. Who were the children that remained in the ghetto? Were they the children of officials in the Judenrat? Uh, in the Judenrat, yeah. Um, uh, not that I know of, to, to that question. The, the children who, who survived in the ghetto were, were various people, like Hena Kuchar, who I mentioned, who you know, she happened to have this whole family of support and, and, um, and they managed to survive for many years. Uh, and then at the very end, she was left, she was left all alone. Um, but there, there were various situations of, of children who, who survived um, in, in many miraculous ways. So each, each one of these stories is really individual. It's hard to, hard to categorize it uh, in, a, in a simple way. Uh, the other question was, How remind me. Oh, how successful were bunkers? Uh, also, really, really hard to hard to say. I mean, we have this um, we have this map of of the bunkers uh, here. Uh, most of these bunkers were were found at some point, um, or or burned. So as they started to burn down the buildings, if the bunker was in the basement of a building, uh, the building often collapsed, 
and, and then the bunker was, was useless. There were some uh, bunkers that were built in courtyards that, that could be uh, hidden, uh, that would be protected in that way, but, um, but many times they were, they were found. Uh, there were cases, many cases actually, where uh, Jews were captured and were either forced or told to give up the location of other bunkers, um, and oftentimes they, they were revealing the, the location of these bunkers. Um, probably because they, they felt that they could save themselves in that way. Yeah. Um, what have been the major sources of historical documents? Like, I know the name the Ringelblum Archive, but like, have there been other like, significant like, finds of documentation? Mm -hmm. um, I'm mostly just curious as to what they are. So the Ringelblum Archive essentially stops uh, with the Great Deportation Action in the summer of 1942. Most of the people who were involved in the Ringblum Archive were killed at that point. Um, and it was uh, soon thereafter that they decided to hide the contents of the Ringblum Archive, um, which was a, a project, uh, if for, for those of you who don't know, was a project started by a, a Polish historian, uh, Emanuel Ringelblum, um, and he decided that this was a, that the moment of the, of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was worth uh, documenting, and so they were gathering uh, interviews with, with various figures in the ghetto. They were also um, keeping track of the underground press, uh, also recording what was said on the radio. So it's a, a massive trove of, of documents and the Jewish Historical Institute in Poland has published uh, all of it and it is now being translated into English. I'm sure that uh, some of the volumes are, are available in English and they're available online for free. Um, but the rest of it and, and all of its, I don't know, what is it, 17 volumes or something like that, uh, will, be, will be available uh, relatively soon in English, which is great. Uh, so the sources for, because uh, it ended in 42, the sources for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising are mostly the remembrances of people who survived. Mm -hmm. Some of these diaries, like I mentioned, the Marilka diary that was found, uh, which is a very, very valuable source, obviously. Um, and, and then the Stroop Report, the, the Nazi German perspective on this. Uh, and uh, we have a little bit of information also from the Polish underground on this, but they actually knew very little about what was happening inside the ghetto. They only had, had people on the outside. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, uh, still formulating my question. Uh, there's a bunch of other uh, big museums in Poland that could talk about the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Warsaw, I guess, Warsaw Uprising Museum itself that gives the Jewish questions pretty short shrift from my recollection a few years ago. And then up in Gdansk, the uh, War World War II, II Museum. Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, do you have any insights on that? Uh, so I haven't been to the World War II Museum yet. I shouldn't admit that, but I haven't been yet. Um, but I need to hop on a train and, and get up there. Um, so I don't know how they, how they deal with it, honestly. But I can assume from what happened with the, with the exhibition that it, it doesn't get much of a, uh, a treatment. Other thoughts, thoughts questions? questions? Yeah, of course. Um, Use uh, your privilege. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, pure power heads. Uh, um, so um, my question is partly for you as a his historian in the museum. Um, uh, is uh, how does focusing on non-German, non-Nazi sources change how the story looks? Um, what, what, what kind of historical narrative emerges without dependence on the Stroop Report? Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic question. So I think there, there are a couple of things. One of them is that I want, to, I want to draw attention to the fact that the photographs that we see from the German perspective are used for a purpose, right? They're, they're used for a particular uh, narrative, they're used to support a particular narrative, and they're also used to prove some anti-Semitic stereotypes uh, in large part. And what changes? What changes is that we are somewhat closer to the quote unquote truth Right, and we're we're uh, we're giving um, we're giving voice, and we're giving not voice, but we're giving space to uh, to these other um, these other ways of seeing the world, and and hopefully um, pushing these other images off to the side. So in the exhibition that we have, the temporary exhibition that we have, there is no usage whatsoever of images from from the Germans 
or text from the Germans. So it was all text and images from either Poles or Jews. Um, and obviously that was done on purpose to try to push those things off to the side and say, let's, let's, uh, let's stop using German propaganda, essentially, as our main source for, for this uh, history. Does, it, does that shift the way that the story can be told is told? Or, I, is it, yeah. or is it partly about quite reasonably trying to replace historical memory of the sources of historical memory, you know, with ones that are, um, are more palatable, ones that we would mm -hmm. want to uh, empathize with? Well, I, I think that first and foremost it shows that, uh, that the German images are showing a particular, you know, a particular view, right? And the, the Strope Report, the text of the Strope Report is utter nonsense in a lot of ways, right? Like I, I mentioned that it, it keeps on talking about the, the Polish fighters who are inside the ghetto when there were no Polish fighters inside the ghetto, right? So if we were going to rely on those kinds of sources, we're just going to be repeating, you know, false statements about, about what happened. Um, and I think, yeah, so then that's, uh, that's a way that uh, Strope and, and his uh, Nazi friends were, were taking away agency from the Jews. So we need to return that agency to, to the Jewish fighters. That's the truth. Yes, I mean, yeah, that's the truth, right? Yeah. The truth is as close as we can get there, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So to go from important topics to the more trivial, I'm wondering why you said that having a sign machine was the biggest between life and death. Yeah, so, um, so having, a, having access to a, a sewing machine could give you uh, the right to live within the ghetto. So if you, if you had um, a, a document that said that you were a, um, a what's the, the word, a seam, seamstress? What's the male a form? Tailor. A seam? Tailor, a tailor. A tailor or a seamstress, uh, then that could uh, be the difference between deportation or allowing you to stay and stay alive. Uh, Maybe it's just another day, but it could be the difference between life and death uh, in that sense. We had a fantastic talk in a full by Uwe Westphal, which is available on the CJS website, about um, actually the Jewish fashion industry well before the war, but also uh, its, its, its story during the Holocaust. And um, because um, Jews were particularly um, uh, uh, well represented in the fashion industries uh, in Germany, Eastern Europe, that there's a strong connection. But I recommend Uwe Westphal's talk is really brilliant and it's available on our website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I swear this is the last no, no, no. question. <clears throat> First, there's a comment. Thank you for this powerful presentation. And I believe that Marek Edelman was a cardiologist. And then a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. He was a cardiologist, not a gynecologist. The tactic to go through walls rather than expose themselves to German fire was a tactic used by the IDF in the Battle of Jenin. Am I saying that correctly? Is that tactic discussed by any of the survivors? Go through walls rather than expose themselves to German fire? No idea. Sorry. I have to deflect on that one. No, no idea about IDF strategy and its relationship to the Warsaw so Ghetto Press. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really fascinating and important, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.